Dr. Audrey Provenzano is a primary care doctor at the Chelsea Health Center, affiliated with Mass General Hospital in Boston. She's also the producer and host of the Review of Systems podcast, which covers a wide range of primary care topics from innovations to healthcare policy. Her recent piece in the New England Journal of Medicine is entitled, Caring for Miss L, Overcoming My Fear of Treating Opioid Use Disorder. Dr. Provenzano, thanks for joining me on Doc to Doc. Thanks for having me. Your New England Journal piece tells the story of Miss L, with whom you had a long primary care relationship until she came to you with a new problem. Uh, tell us what happened then. Sure, so I met her a couple of years before, and maybe a year and a half before, and she had, like so many of my patients, and there were chronic diseases, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, but I don't know, she's just one of those patients who, I, we just had an easy relationship and I loved seeing her and she had a history of opioid use disorder but it just never came up. She had been in remission for, for decades, for a really long time and she relapsed and came to me and asked to start Suboxone and I couldn't at the time, I was not wavered which was a conscious choice. I didn't, I didn't feel, um, I just didn't feel equipped. I felt you know, guilty about it, but I just didn't feel like I could handle it and that um, I knew how to care for those patients. And so I referred her to a colleague who, you know, really provided excellent care for her. Um, and so I just wrote about um, that experience. So before we get into what happened with Ms. L, for, for those physicians who aren't as familiar with uh, uh, suboxone or buprenorphine. Um, can you describe the, the waiver process and the reasoning behind it? Oh, sure. So buprenorphine came out, I think, around 2000 or 2001, and it's you know meant to treat opioid use disorder. It stimulates the same receptors in the brain as other opioids do, but the pharmacokinetics are such that it um, doesn't pr produce any kind of sensation of feeling high. It just helps people feel normal. And, um, you know, it's because of the stigma and probably some other policy reasons, um, it's pretty highly regulated, so you have to get a waiver to prescribe it, which is an eight-hour online course and, um, and then taking an exam. Um, there are live courses that you can go to as well, but I did mine online. Um, it, the pharmacokinetics of it are really straightforward, but... Um, I think that that additional barrier of um, having to get wavered, um, you know, certainly contributed to my hesitation about it, and I think probably other physicians in the community as well. Yeah, it seems this is a, you know, eight hours is not excessive, but nevertheless, that's a that's a hurdle for those of us who are who are pretty busy uh, day to day to to jump. And I I would tend to agree. You're by engaging in that, you're sort of saying. You know, okay, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start treating opioid use disorder. On the other hand, the existence of this course and a waiver and special certification, I mean, in some ways provides what seems like a convenient excuse. You know, I can look a patient in the eye and say, gosh, I'd love to help. I am not legally allowed to prescribe this drug. Let me refer you elsewhere. Do you think that docs uh, are embracing that? excuse is the the sort of need for certification does it allow them to potentially not deal with a problem that is obviously hard to deal with this opioid use disorder is an incredibly difficult condition to treat um, in other words is it more than just the time commitment is it a uh, a fear of engaging uh, in that treatment paradigm you know, I can't speak for anyone else. I mean, all I can say is that it was a barrier for me and it was a, you know, in a way, an excuse for me. I think that, you know, you think about the harm, everything in medicine is, we talk about the benefits and the harms, right? And um, I can prescribe enough opiates to snow, like all of Chelsea, <laughs> but I had to do this extra course to prescribe a life-saving medication that actually is incredibly safe and you know can do more in the primary care setting to reduce mortality than I think almost anything else we can prescribe. So I think that 
obviously stigma plays a big role in all of those <laughs> risk and benefit uh, calculations and uh, the calculus, internal calculus that we all do about whether or not we get wavered. So I think it's a complicated question. I think that it's a reasonable policy question to revisit about whether this wavering process is, you know, prohibitive, if it's appropriate, if there are ways that uh, policy could be adjusted to make it easier for people to access care and um, make doctors feel less hesitation about prescribing this really safe, life-saving drug. I'm going to go back to Ms. L for a moment now. One of the things that really struck me is, you know, you, you have an affiliation with Mass General Hospital. There's no shortage of, of specialists that can help um, with her treatment. And uh, you referred her to an, an excellent provider who was willing to treat her opioid use disorder. And yet you reported or you wrote in your story that she never came back to you as, as her primary care doc after that moment, despite this long history together, um, what do you think happened there? Um, and how did, how did that affect you? Yeah. Well, I, I should clarify and just say that I met her um, at a, another job, so I met her at another clinic. But um, yeah, she never came back. I, I really think that it was just you know, she felt so vulnerable about it. And, um, you know, as I say, it had, it had literally almost never come up. It was on her problem list. I think maybe in our first visit, we talked about it, but it, it just never came up. And she, you know, I think she, she'd been through a lot. And I think she was really ashamed about her relapse. And it took a lot for her to come to me and ask for this. And even though we had, you know, a, a pre-existing relationship, and um, I think that just—I don't know—I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe it just fractured something for her. And I think at that point, her life was uh, really complicated. And obviously, getting treatment for her opioid use disorder at that point was a lot more important for her than her diabetes and other issues. So. Yeah, I, I don't know entirely what happened, but um, I, I think about her a lot, all, all the time. And what, what did end up happening uh, with Miss L? So she, um, yeah, she never came back. I um, had some follow-up appointments, but booked, but she never came back. And um, she kind of is, I think, um, I'm not entirely sure that the program that I had referred her to was a, a good fit. Um, and um, I think maybe moved on to try other other places. Um, and I kind of lost track of her. And then, um, you know, I think maybe a year and a half or two years later, um, she popped back up in the EMR. I was preparing for clinic and um, just saw that she had been she had been brought in and had died of an overdose. That must have been really, really difficult for you. It's it's always hard to lose a patient, but I think this in particular because of that added moment of of referring her to someone else. I mean, it, obviously an appropriate referral, but um, it, it comes across very clearly in what you wrote, how sort of devastating that feeling was for you, maybe more so than when we lose um, other patients. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was absolutely uh, devastating. Now, you went ahead and, and, and that uh, experience led you to, to go ahead and go through this course and get the waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, you're actively using this in your practice now? Yeah, I see patients for it um, almost every day at this point. And um, it's been a <laughs> incredible journey. I've learned so much. I, I'm very lucky in my practice. I have a colleague, Joe Joyner, who's um, addiction boarded and I can run things by him. There is an addiction psychiatrist on staff. We have a really wonderful recovery coach. So I'm very lucky. I'm surrounded by a lot of great resources and there are places for me to refer patients who are, you know, really complicated and need people with more experience. Um, but it, it's been, I've been able to integrate 
opioid use disorder into my primary care practice um, really well, and I've really enjoyed it. What would you say to those uh, primary care providers who, who maybe don't have that infrastructure near them, um, who are you know, either in a solo practice or a small group practice, you know, they don't have addiction specialists nearby. Um, would you encourage them to get the waiver and start treating patients, uh, or do you think that backup is necessary? Gosh, that's a hard question. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a judgment everyone has to make for themselves. I would just say again that it's a really safe medication, and um, if you're able to build a referral network in your community, um, you know, I really urge people to, to consider it. Um, because I do think having some backup is, is important, especially at first. Um, I, I, I did use the online program, the PCSS uh, program. It's like a online uh, peer support program for people. You can sign up and get a mentor who you can run cases by over email or phone. And uh, that was very helpful. So maybe for folks who don't work in an area where they can easily build a referral network, um, it's a good resource. Um, but I also think that um, we're not going to adequately meet the need of the opioid epidemic unless we, you know, are more active in primary care treating addiction. Um, so I would encourage people to at least consider it. Do you have any clinical tips or, 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 or pearls uh, for people starting out using uh, buprenorphine? Uh, to, to physicians, I mean. Um, Anything you've learned as you've started to treat patients that, you know, we, we should be aware of? Gosh, I think, <laughs> I think uh, the biggest one is, um, you know, learn from your patients. Um, a lot of patients, when they come into treatment, they're very motivated, um, and they know a lot about Suboxone. They've heard from friends and people who um, they know who are in recovery. Um, some probably have used some on the street uh, and so they they know how it works they know usually um, kind of what dosing is adequate for them um, so a patient really I mean like always uh, are your best resource in trying to um, start someone on it I think well, Dr. Audrey Provenzano, uh, your piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, again, was, was incredibly touching. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for uh, trying to treat uh, uh, patients uh, with this condition. I very much hope that your story inspires more doctors uh, in primary care and in other specialties to go ahead um, and get this waiver and to learn about uh, this drug, which actually may impact the uh, opiate epidemic in the United States. Thanks once again for joining me. Sure, thanks so much for having me.